Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Lamin, and I'm going to talk to you today on one of the introductory topics from the Essential Aspects of Error Medical Retrieval course, which is part of the STAR program. The topic for discussion is modes of transport. And there are four objectives for this session. Firstly, to consider the requirements for the ideal mode of transport. Secondly, to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each. Thirdly, to start to introduce the evidence base for transport selection. And fourthly, just to touch on some of the relevant safety issues, which I'm hoping will prompt you to do a little bit more research and leading on the topic. The gold standard. I think it's always good to set the gold standard out front at the beginning of any session like this so that we know what we're striving for. Unfortunately, as you can see from this picture, I suspect that your service is probably not dissimilar to ours in that budget constraints would limit the ability to provide this sort of setup for the medical team. But what can we hope to achieve in terms of trying to get in the gold standard? Well, firstly, we want a system that's easily available and safe. We also want it to be cost effective because that's a commercial reality these days. Then, when we get to the next three points, the fact that it needs to be spacious, easy to get in and out of, and give you access to the whole patient, you would think that they were no-brainers. But the reality is that it is extremely hard to find all three of those criteria fulfilled in any form of transport available around the world today. Fast, comfortable, quiet, those are obviously important characteristics. Door-to-door, -door, the ability to actually have to minimize the transfers with your patient is extremely important. We know that some of the most significant and adverse patient events occur when you're moving a patient from one place to another. If you can minimize the handovers and the transfers, uh, you certainly can optimize patient safety. Easy to divert uh, if circumstances dictate, and not weather dependent or geographically dependent would be important characteristics. Certainly, a mode of transport that doesn't cause a physiological consequence to the patient is extremely important. And as we'll see, that really doesn't exist. Um, and we have an entire session on the physiological consequences of retrieval, which uh, you'll be uh, given the opportunity to tap into a little bit later. Uh, an adequate power supply, a large center of gravity, and perhaps the ability to replicate the resuscitation bay in your hospital uh, might well be considered important criteria as well. The reality is that the ideal gold standard form of transport does not exist. There are three main modes of transport available to you as a retrieval clinician, ground ambulance, rotary wing, and fixed wing. Ah, okay, choice of transport. A choice of transport is gonna be dependent on a number of uh, factors. The clinical scenario is gonna be one of the most important. And uh, the diagnosis and the stability of your patient are clearly uh, factors that need to be thought about. But most importantly, the anticipated complications that might actually occur during the transport phase. And the reason for that is that the mode of transport that you actually select might significantly hamper your ability to deal with those complications if they should arise. The urgency for definitive care and the current level of care that the patient are receiving are important factors that will help you in your determination of how quickly you need to move the patient from location A to location B and what form of transport can best achieve that. Patient numbers are important, but remember that in the majority of cases, you're gonna be transporting one or maybe two patients at any one time, unless you're obviously dealing with a mass casualty disaster type scenario. Availability, remember that just because you want it doesn't mean that it's gonna be there. Weather and traffic are extremely important. Weather, of course, plays a very significant role uh, with uh, rotary wing and fixed wing assets, whereas traffic, of course, will have a substantial influence on uh, ground ambulance. Local geography, distance, terrain, accessibility are all important factors. That's one of the great advantages that we'll talk about later uh, with rotary wing assets in that they have enormous environmental accessibility and get, get to places that, uh, that uh, other forms of transport really don't have any chance uh, in, uh, in reaching. And safety and cost, we've mentioned them before and we'll mention them again. We'll make no apologies for that. And in fact, we'll talk a lot about safety in some of the future STAR sessions as well. Okay, so ground ambulance. I think we've all seen one of those and uh, I would think that the vast majority of people would have at one stage or another uh, been involved in the transport uh, in the back of an ambulance. 
Okay, there are obviously quite a few advantages to using a ground ambulance. Uh, firstly, they're easily available, and secondly, they do have the capacity to deliver the patient in a door-to-door -door manner. That's actually particularly important because one of the things that we do know is that a lot of the complications that occur during transport occur during the phases when you're physically moving the patient. That's when basically you tend to get distracted, you tend not to notice adverse consequences that might be evolving in your patient, and that's when bits of equipment and monitoring and so forth tend to basically fall off or fall apart. If we can minimize those physical handovers, uh, then we've obviously got the capacity to improve patient safety. So an ambulance does allow you to move, for example, from your emergency room physically once into the back of the ambulance and then physically a second time from the back of the ambulance into the emergency room. Minimizing those handovers, uh, it's an important point and, and uh, one that really uh, sometimes gets underestimated. Ambulances are easy to divert. Uh, should circumstances uh, require it, and they're generally relatively roomy to work in in the back. Uh, most people are fairly familiar with the back of an ambulance. They're relatively low cost in the grand scheme of uh, transport modalities, and they do have a well-established infrastructure. And whilst traffic constraints can be an issue, there usually aren't too many weather constraints that would affect the, uh, the function of a ground ambulance. Disadvantages, though, are that they uh, do require lengthy transit times over long distances or difficult terrain. And at what point, uh, at what distance, does that become significant? And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Obviously, we already talked about the fact that they're subject to traffic conditions. Uh, and it's important to remember that there's a bit of a rough ride in most ambulances. They tend to have firm suspensions and relatively high center of gravities, and they can induce motion sickness. And, look, you know, there would be quite a number of retrieval team members who uh, could put up their hand uh, and profess to having felt uh, significantly sick in the back of an ambulance. And, of course, that does have an ability uh, of significantly compromising uh, your capacity to provide good and effective patient care. Uh, and, and of course, those, uh, those characteristics might also uh, adversely affect the patient themselves. Uh, rotary wing. Uh, and this is, in fact, a picture of a Black Hawk with the uh, government flying service in Hong Kong, uh, where a number of years back I provided uh, a training program very similar to STAR uh, for their aeromedical service and the Black Hawk indeed was the platform that they were utilizing uh, for both primary and uh, into hospital uh, transfer and uh, a very roomy helicopter uh, with a lot of capability um, and probably not your average retrieval platform uh, for most civilian services. The advantages of uh, a helicopter are that it does provide rapid transport times over moderate distances. And again, we'll debate what those distances are a little bit later. One of the great things about helicopters is accessibility. And you can see in the picture there, for example, that if you were trying to retrieve a patient from that particular peak, uh, there really aren't too many other ways to get there unless you're going to physically carry that patient down the mountain. And environmental accessibility of helicopters is really one of the unique phenomena of that particular platform. They're also highly maneuverable and extremely versatile. In many ways, you could argue that they can pretty much go anywhere. And that is a major advantage for, uh, for the rotary wing uh, mode of transport. Okay, there are a number of disadvantages in using rotary wing. The first is that it does require an adequate hospital-based landing site for immediate access into definitive care. I worked in a system a number of years back where you had to land at a uh, local park about one kilometer from the uh, hospital. Now that may not seem like a great distance, but it often added 15 to 20 minutes to the overall transport time. And the bulk of that was due to the issues in trying to match up the arrival time of the helicopter with the arrival time of the ambulance. Uh, furthermore, uh, it actually increases the number of physical handovers that you have to actually uh, do with the patient, the number of physical movements. So in this case, you have to now move the patient from the helicopter to the ambulance and then again from the ambulance into the hospital itself. And remember how we talked earlier that it's those physical movement stages uh, during which uh, there is an increased incidence of adverse consequences for patients. Getting in and out of helicopters and the amount of space and access to the patient you have once you're in them can obviously be a very substantial factor. But that is very dependent on the actual platform that you're utilizing. If you're utilizing a single engine squirrel, you might have a very significant problem. If you are using the Black Hawk that we showed you in one of the previous pictures, you can mitigate some of those problems to a certain degree. Now, we'll spend quite a bit of time on the STAR program in later sessions looking at very specific platforms and the advantages and disadvantages of each. 
Weather and fuel constraints are obviously important. And remember that uh, the rotary wing assets that are traditionally used by aeromedical services uh, are non-pressurized. And what that means is that the patient is exposed to the full effects of altitude. And we will spend quite a bit of time later in a, in a subsequent session uh, talking about the physiological consequences uh, of altitude. Uh, not just on the patient, but also on the staff. And I very specifically at this moment uh, would just highlight noise and vibration because we know that exposure to noise and vibration uh, has the capacity to uh, affect psychomotor skills and also to impair sort of cognitive decision-making abilities. What that means is that if you work in that sort of environment for a significant length of time, you may not actually be making your decisions quite as well as you otherwise would. And... Uh, that can obviously be a significant factor when it comes to patient safety. Um, it's not always easy to maintain thermal integrity. It can be extremely cold in a helicopter and a lot of patients can lose heat very quickly. And conversely, a helicopter left on the ground uh, during, say, a, a typical Queensland summer uh, can achieve cockpit temperatures of close to 50 degrees Celsius and it can effectively be like a greenhouse. Incident light uh, exposure can be a problem and there are quite substantial training requirements if we really want to optimize safety within the rotary wing platform and those training requirements are not only onerous in terms of time but they're also onerous in terms of cost and overall rotary wing systems are actually extremely expensive uh, particularly when you compare them to uh, ground ambulance and also uh, to some degree uh, when you compare them to fixed wing systems and that brings us nicely to uh, fixed wing Okay, one of the main advantages of fixed wing is the capacity to affect rapid transport over long distances. Uh, pressurization is generally an option, although not always because it clearly is platform dependent, but the ability to pressurize can be important uh, in mitigating against the physiological consequences of altitude. Uh, clearly fixed wing uh, operate at a higher ceiling and have the ability to fly around bad weather which is something that helicopters can often find extremely difficult to do. There is generally a relatively larger cabin space in the fixed wing environment than you would find in the rotary wing and they are also quieter operating environments to work in and we already talked about some of the effects of noise but we'll cover that in obviously much greater detail in one of the physiological sessions. Okay, so if we start to think about some of the disadvantages of the fixed wing, one of the key points is that you require an airstrip to take off or land from. And this may not always be in close proximity to your patient or your hospital. And again, it necessitates the use of a form of secondary transport, usually a ground ambulance. So we get back to the situation we talked about before, which is the multiple patient handling, multiple physical transfers that are required to occur. There are also substantial takeoff and landing forces that are generated by fixed wing aircraft, and we'll talk a lot more about those when we discuss the physiological consequences of retrieval. Okay, distance. Now we've already talked about distance as a potential advantage or disadvantage of each of the modalities we've discussed up until now. But one of the key questions that we need to think about is at what distance does one mode of transport become effectively more useful than another? We know intuitively that ground ambulance is appropriate for very short distances, that helicopters are probably most appropriate for medium distances, and that fixed wing is the ideal utility for long distance. But where does that transition actually occur, and how do we actually go about determining it? It's actually quite a complex question, and it's really not that easy to answer. Let's just look at three papers that, uh, that are out there uh, and, and easily accessible. The first is the Australian College for Emergency Medicine uh, Policy on Minimum Standards for Transport of the Critically Ill, which were originally published in 1993, but have been reviewed uh, on a number of occasions since then. Well, they suggested that patients less than 30 minutes by road were unlikely to benefit from helicopter transportation. Uh, Thomas Wisham et al. in uh, 1990 actually looked at the uh, difference between fixed wing and rotary wing at ranges of 101 to 150 radial miles. What they found was that there was no significant difference in time to hospital and, most importantly, no difference in outcome for trauma patients. What they did find, which was significant, was that their rotary wing system cost 400 times that of their fixed wing. And that's a very significant issue that needs to be taken into consideration when one looks at developing an EMS or AME system.
Diaz Hendy et al. in 2005 actually did a comparison of helicopter and ground ambulance transport times. What they found was that ground ambulance was always faster at distances of less than 16 kilometers, something which I suspect we all intuitively know when we're talking about those ultra short distances. At greater distances, what they found was that HEMS was actually faster if simultaneously dispatched, i.e. at the same time as the ambulance was dispatched. Now, in the real world, that's an extremely unlikely scenario. And in the real world, it takes a lot longer to get an aircraft up in the air than it does a ground ambulance out of its garage. So in the real world, ground ambulance is likely to be faster, and they felt probably likely to be faster up to 70 kilometer distance. If you try to make sense of all of that, and I think it's important to bear in mind that we've only looked at three papers here, and there was a whole lot of other literature that, uh, that that's out there that is worthy of review, and we'll certainly be looking at that in future sessions. But if we do try to make sense of it all, what do we come up with? We could come up with some guidelines at best, and they could probably work this way. Ground ambulance is probably the fastest form of uh, transport at distances up to around 16 kilometers. Between 16 and 160 kilometers, it's an either or, ground ambulance or rotary wing, and it really ultimately depends on exactly how you set up and exactly how you utilize and in particular task your system. Rotary wing probably comes into its own somewhere over the 100 kilometer mark, but we really just don't know where. And fixed wing probably comes into its own definitively at around the 240 kilometer mark. But the reality is we don't really know, and it is very, very much user dependent, system dependent. So these are guidelines at best. I just want to bring safety into the issue now for just a couple of minutes, but I'm not going to dwell on it too much because we cover safety in all its facets later on in the staff program. However, this is an interesting review from the uh, Air Medical Physicians Association in 2002 who conducted a safety review and risk assessment in air medical transport. It's actually quite an extensive document, but one of the things that you can get out of it is this graph here which is the fatal crashes per million flight hours. And what you can see on the right-hand side is that medical helicopters basically accounted for 19 fatal crashes per million flight hours, as opposed to, say, commercial airliners, which effectively uh, reached a total of one. What's also disturbing is that ground ambulance, which one would consider to be relatively safe, actually came up with a number of 12. Now, whether these numbers actually reflect a scenario in the United States where there's often very aggressive and active competition between EMS services to reach the scene of an incident is difficult to know. And that's one of the sort of points of discussion that we'll be having in a later uh, program where we look at the different systems that exist uh, and, and the different models that exist around the world. From the, same, uh, from the same review, you can also tease this out, which uh, just adds to the, uh, to the sort of sobering uh, aspects of, uh, of thinking about uh, working within the EMS world. This basically looks at the activities uh, that produce a one in a thousand risk of death and how much time or effort you have to put into that activity to effectively achieve that risk. And you will see that for HEMS, transport, it's effectively only 32.9 hours, as opposed to 55 for driving a motorbike, 340 for skiing, and almost 1200 for flying on a scheduled airline. And if you're driving your car, you need to basically travel 52,000 miles to produce a 1 in 1,000 risk of death. So when you look at that, you can see that the HEMS transport at that time, in 2002, was essentially uh, not without significant risk. But that was 2002, so what's happening today? Well, let's look at uh, the National Transport Safety Board review on HEMS-related activities in the United States and look at that 2008 stat, 13 accidents and 29 fatalities. So whilst there's a little bit of up and down, there's certainly no doubt that risk has clearly not been eliminated and it remains a substantial uh, consideration when one, uh, when one thinks about working within, uh, within certainly specifically a HEMS system. And it's really difficult to know how that might translate to other aspects of the uh, overall retrieval system. But uh, again, that's a point that we'll be discussing at a later time. In Australia, you can look at this HEMS data. It's somewhat old, 1992 to 2002, and it was published in the Medical Journal of Australia in 2005. 
but its conclusion was basically an accident rate of 4.38 per 100,000 flying hours and a fatality rate of 14.6 per million flying hours. Now that's certainly less than the 2002 AMPA stats, but by the same token, it's not less enough that we should be complacent or less assured about the systems that we work in. And we know and are certainly aware that there have been accidents since 2002 in Australia. And in future sessions, we'll be trying to present an analysis of those, uh, of those uh, accidents. Um, there's no doubt that also, um, whilst we might talk about which mode of transport uh, we need to think about utilising, within a given mode, there are controversies in themselves. For example, with rotary wing, there's uh, a significant controversy that exists between whether twin engine versus single engine aircraft are better. In some respects, if you start to get pilots to talk about this, it's probably analogous to getting doctors to talking about crystalloid versus colloid. One of the things that can be said is that there is in fact no definitive proven scientifically created safety benefits of one over the other. But twins are generally perceived to be safer, more powerful. But they do cost more to buy initially and they do have approximately 30% more ongoing operating costs. However, they are increasingly regulated for AME work and that's certainly the case in Australasia. And as a consequence of that, it may well be that the debate will be stifled by mere virtue of the fact that you may have no choice within your AME service as to which form you go with. Okay, so do you really understand your choices? We started off by saying that this was a relatively simple introductory lecture on modes of transport, and we have kept the content at a relatively introductory level. But I hope that one of the things that you've teased out of this is that, in fact, it's not that simple. And the decision-making processes around picking the right mode of transport to affect the safest possible option for your patient is actually an extremely complex one. It involves a lot of decision-making and a lot of parameters that need to be considered. And you, as the retrieval clinician, must be intimately involved in that decision making process. Some of the things that I want to leave you with, which are really more sort of food for thought and topics perhaps for future discussion down the track. If you're developing an EMS system, the cheapest mode of transport is not necessarily the cheapest to run. In other words, the cheapest to buy is not necessarily the cheapest to operate. The fastest may not necessarily mean that it offers you the best range, and certainly the fastest does not necessarily mean the safest. In terms of flying per se, the shortest flight time does not necessarily mean the shortest time to definitive care, and I think the example I quoted to you before of the rotary wing surveys I used to be involved with uh, exemplifies that point quite nicely. A lot of safety benefits are mooted around individual platforms for transport, but remember that they may only apply if you utilize that transport platform within strict weight limits and within specific profiles. And then there's all sorts of controversies. We already alluded to single engine versus twin for rotary wing, where the same argument actually exists for fixed wing, and then there are controversies around turboprop versus jet, VFR versus IFR, and so on and so forth. Obviously, this is not the forum to discuss those, but they are issues that we will want to debate in future STAR sessions. So, where does that leave us in conclusion? Well, I would like to leave you uh, with these points in summary. Firstly, and most importantly, the need to actually individualize the mode of transport to the patient's clinical need. And in doing that, there's a lot of parameters that need to be considered, but particularly local knowledge, especially geographical. The actual potential need for time critical interventions and how you would go about undertaking those time critical interventions if they were required within the transport phase. Obviously, one needs to consider the availability of and the impact of a particular mode of transport on existing resources. And most importantly, risks and benefits of using one particular platform over another need to be weighed up and considered. Safety is paramount. It's paramount not only for the patient's well-being, but also for the well-being of the crew. And that needs to factor very much into your decision-making processes. At the end of the day, it's important that you understand your transport choice, you understand its limitations, and you understand its capabilities. So thank you very much for um, taking the time to, uh, to listen to this podcast with us. And uh, I'll leave you with a couple of closing comments. One from Thomas Edison, uh, who obviously would have been a great proponent of the helicopter, uh, when he said that no airplane will be good enough until it can go straight up and down. And, uh, and then the uh, anonymous quote below, uh, which perhaps uh, takes the opposite stance, which is that helicopters can't fly, they're just so ugly that the earth repels them. Once again, thank you very much, and we look forward to talking to you again in a future STAR session.